Hello everyone, what's up? Some of you will already have seen my first two History of the Forge World style of painting videos. In this third installment, however, it won't be me telling you about how I think this style of painting came to be. Instead, you're gonna hear it from one of the actual protagonists of this saga, Matt Murphy Kane. As the sole dedicated studio painter for a period of three years, Matt was responsible for painting not only countless vehicles and marines, but also seminal models such as Sevatar, Karn, Conrad Kurz, Vulcan, Ferus Manus, Mortarion, or Horus the Wardmaster himself. All the images you will see on the background are Matt's own work, which he was very kind to share with us. Since this is a very long video, I recommend you grab a drink and a snack. Now the timestamps are in the description, but I hope you stick with us until the end. Well, hello Matt, and welcome to the Race for Terra. It's an incredible honor to have you with us tonight. Hello, uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. So I've got quite the list of questions for you, if you don't mind. Um, starting with, if you could tell us for how many years you worked for Forgeworld and in which capacity exactly? Uh, so I worked for just coming up to three years in the studio for Forgeworld. Um, and my official job was uh, miniature painter and model uh, master mold maker. So uh, I, I used to, <laughs> my, my job was two, twofold, um, but there was also my friend Neil who um, also had the same job title, but he preferred to do the mold making and I preferred to do the painting side of things. So I did most of the painting and he did pretty much all of the mold making. I did the odd little bit here and there for various people if they needed stuff done quite, quite <laughs> urgently. Oh, that's fascinating. Huh. Uh, thank you. Um, Matt, I didn't know this at the time that I published these two little uh, virtual videos, and I do apologize for that. Uh, no worries. It, turn, it, it turns out that you painted a lot of the heresy models that I've shown, and a lot that I'm still to show, and most of my favorites, actually. So, all in all, how many heresy models would you say you, you've painted in total? Must be loads. Oh, crikey. Yeah. Um, three years worth <laughs> I, can't, <laughs> I can't put an exact number on it so I, I can't remember off the top of my head but I just had a continuous line of miniatures that had to be painted for the, for the company as each designer was to finish something it would go into my drawer of stuff full of, full of bits that needed to be painted and I would get it painted um, and being that I was pretty much the only person painting for the studio um, in an official capacity for that period of time um I, I would just be a one-man conveyor belt um there was other people that would paint for me um when i when i was so snowed under with the amount of bits that i needed to paint because it wasn't just the stuff for the website it was also stuff for like book production and mm -hmm. um displays for events that i would have to get done as well um right th the other guys would join in so um like Phil um, and Mark um, would every now and then paint something that I wasn't able to get done as well. Um, certainly when I first started there, um, I wasn't given the tasks of painting some of the, the uh, character series that came out just after I got there. Uh, thing, uh, Abaddon and Loken was the first one, which Mark painted. Right. Um, and then Fulgrim, um, I didn't paint him either. He was painted by uh, Keith. Um, Keith was, was an ex, or he is an ex heavy metal painter. Um, and he came across the studio as a miniature designer. Um, but I, and as time went on, and, and being that the, the, the idea of Fulgrim was going to be built so that he was fe fighting Ferris Man, so I thought actually Keith painting to an heavy metal style fitted quite well for Fulgrim because he's so uh, right. well finished if you like um, and, and very uh, very clean in what the imagery of Fulgrim is supposed to be mm -hmm. so with Keith painting it so pristine and then I painted Ferris Manus um, in quite a dirty grungy sort of look I think they contrasted against each other very nicely, um, both in the styles of painting and also in the, the actual finish and the colors and the, 
warmth of Fulgrim, the coldness of, mm-hmm. of Ferris. Well, it's fascinating. Um, I had no idea. I'm sure the, the fans will agree with me that that was an excellent choice. Yeah, well, at, at the time, it, it very well, unless some, somebody made the decision above what me, uh, made it for that reason. I, I don't think that was the idea, but um, I, I think it was very much just because I was new to the painting role and they wanted other people that were quite established to paint those miniatures um, at the time. Um, so... I would get all of the rest of the stuff that was coming through to, to get painted. And there was an awful lot whilst they were painting those miniatures. Um, and not just those miniatures, but there were other miniatures that came out throughout the time that I was there that yeah. I wasn't able to get done be- just, just because of the sheer workload. Um, and other people jump in. Um, when it comes to things like the, uh, the display boards, um, I would start painting stuff um normally five four to five weeks before the event Mm -hmm. and then within the last sort of two weeks or so other people would start painting things as well um (laughs) and then you'd have a team of mm, i think between three and four people working on the actual board itself right um which was normally phil stew and uh blake and then the other guys would join in and start making this massive conveyor about of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miniatures that would go <laughs> onto the display boards um oh Dar- darren Parr would sometimes would uh, get involved in the building of the boards like the taking of the contrador um the spaceship zone mortalis style yeah. um board that we made darren Parr was uh was w- working with the guys on on the actual board for that as well uh certainly on the uh the the fascia of the spaceship if you like the the side wall Mm -hmm. um yeah so 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 that's the capacity if you like so if you uh if you take all of those hundreds of miniatures that went onto those boards and then all of the miniatures that i painted for releases to go into the artwork for books I, i i couldn't even begin to number than the amount of models <laughs> i painted for them <laughs> well it sounds like a task of epic proportions really well yeah yeah it was it was quite it was quite a job um but that, that was what it was it, it was a job um it, albeit it was a, a hobby related job it was my job <laughs> to do it um and i was employed for that um i don't know how i kept up with it i mean these days i believe they've got a team of four painters painting for them now or certainly the last time i heard there was a team of four painters um and and i was pretty much doing it on my todd some of the models have already been shown on screen but of the of all the horus heresy primarchs and characters that you did that i know you did quite a few which one was your favorite that was quite easy that um Ferris Manus, he was the first of the Primarchs that I did. I mean, I, I enjoyed painted, painting all of the character series models that I painted. Um, but Ferris Manus was the, the first one that I was, if you like, trusted to paint. Um, and I learned a hell of a lot by painting him because, um, you know, the, the studio team was pretty close knit. We all worked together uh, and, and I'm re- talking about designers, artists. Um, we we all worked together, and writers even, because Alan Bly would be quite influential in uh, in certain things that got painted the way that they mm. did, because he would give me descriptions of what would be done. Uh, then I'd have Reese Pugh, um, who would who who was like the head of the three artists at the time. You had Dominic and Rachel as well, who would come up with um, color pictures um, to give ideas of what would be done on models he would also then at times use the models that i painted to work on his pictures hmm. um That's fascinating. and then phil as as well phil phil was kind of my mentor uh, in in the studio um he was absolutely amazing the the, the depth <laughs> of knowledge that, that bloke has got is second to none um and i would constantly be darkening his uh, his desk asking him for questions uh, asking <laughs> him for guidance on bits and pieces and i learned so much off him um especially on ferris manus um, on his armor the, the the armor was extremely difficult it was made up of nine different colors um to get the the finish on the armor 
Um, wow. Again, wanting to contrast Fulgrim, where it was very smooth. Um, I didn't want anything like that on Ferris. Man. So the, the concept that I got in my, my head for Ferris was that his armor was that of a smith um, who worked in forges. Um, and it would therefore be having acids and other various forge like materials that were constantly dripping on it and superheating mm-hmm. it and cooling it and mm-hmm. um so so it always it would be pretty grimy in effect um and it wouldn't just be black it would have a myriad of, of colors like a, almost like a, an oil sheen on water whilst being really cold to counter foreground so where it's, it's quite a, a bluish black uh, if you if you like so all of the highlights are not just smooth transitions going up it, they, they're very mottled in effect um and they're swirls and patterns of greens and blues and reds and purples and all sorts it, as if, if you look at different parts of the army you see um coal scuttle black which was something that reese told me to to that, to do from what he was putting into the imagery there, there was a coal scuttle black where the coal in forges would get heated up and scattered around and batter against armor and there would be that redness of, of that in the armor uh, whilst that's countering off of the blue that's in the armor so as you look around the miniature um the, you see all of these different things come together to create the story of his armor which is what i was in, in fact it is what i tried to do in all my models is, is to tell a story and to add depth and um, rather than just painting a miniature, I want to tell the tale of that miniature um, so it brings it to life. Um, and that goes hand in hand with the narrative descriptions that the black books bring and the, the pictures and the artwork. It, it's, it, we, we, as a mm-hmm. four drill team, would kind of try to draw people into the story um, right. so that it doesn't just create a game, it creates a film that is a game that is taking part with every time that you put your models on the table and play against an opponent, you're actually making the story themselves. And I, I was, I was guilty of it myself. Every time I would play a game, I'd run around the <laughs> table taking pictures because it was so thematic, uh, and that's what I wanted to uh, to see on happening on the models. Um, so, yeah, the, another influence on the the, uh, the miniature was Alfonso Giraldez, um, mm-hmm. otherwise known as Banshee, because he was working in the studio as well, and um, on the flesh um because i wanted that sort of grimy cold doesn't come out in the sunlight very often because he's always working in the forges <laughs> type of uh, look to his skin so alfonso told me to uh, to put green and yellow into into skin and wow. i was thinking hey, are, are you mad <laughs> putting green <laughs> into flesh tones and and he said look matt as alfonso does look look matt uh, do you trust me and i'm thinking well, yeah, you've, you've won God, <laughs> God knows how many prizes and paintings, so I'm, I'm not going to say I don't trust you. And he said, well, then just do it. So, uh, so I, I did <laughs> it, and I, he gave me examples of how to work Sotec green into flesh tones, and I did, and it really neutralized the color. Um, and then you put yellows into the flesh tones as well, and sometimes it would go wrong and look jaundiced. And he, he would sh- show me how to use different colors to neutralize other colors that are in there but also to bring flamboyancy to flesh tones where you wanted it all of these things just from painting one miniature just enhanced my ability as a painter um and and made it that much more fun to do i think that is quite a long-winded way of saying ferris manis was my favorite <laughs> i think we'll all agree with you that this is a, a unique a amazing amazing job that you did really really outstanding oh thank you very much right so matt um you're explaining the 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 process whereby you arrived at this wonderful wonderful outcome could you tell us a bit more about these armor panels and and how you achieved that effect because it's really mind-blowing uh yeah it was a it was an awful long time ago but uh i'll try my best um to start off with, we wanted um, a, a sort of blue steel sort of finish for the uh, for the armor. So Phil and I, I say Phil and I, it was mainly Phil that concocted the uh, the originality of the color. Um, came up with this blue steel effect, and then we started overlapping all different uh, washes and glazes. Um, so 
reds and blues and greens and purples and little little tiny patches of black quite often stippling different uh, different colors over the top of each individual and together mm. they all sort of melded together to become um black in areas but in other areas you would see that sort of um that effect that i was trying to achieve with the the idea of it being superheated and different acids and chemicals coming out of the forges and superheating the armor and it cooling and um all of these things that i tried to achieve in the in the finish um as far as the highlights go to to draw your eye to the focus and the the, the uh, direction of the lighting um, yeah. rather than just having smooth blends and transitions it, it wanted to look quite mottled so to achieve that I would absolutely flood the area with um, like a, a medium in this case Lamia medium hmm. um, and then add my colors onto that and it would naturally disperse the colors uh, out across the armor panels it made it really it, it took a long time to get the finish because you had to wait for each bit to dry and then build it up and up and up. Um, wow. And you couldn't use a hairdryer to speed it up because you wanted it to naturally dry and disperse the, the, the colors across the panel to get that, um, right. that mottled effect and the, uh, the not allow it to become a smooth transition from a dark area to a light area. Um, while still getting it into the right, right places to achieve that, uh, that focal highlight to, to show the sourcing and the direction of the lighting. Um, and the, I, I tried to do that throughout the miniature. So where it follows up the leg um, and then onto the chest and then onto the gorget and the shoulder pads, I, would, uh, I, would, I tried to achieve exactly the same thing across the rest of the miniature. So the lighting on the face, the lighting on the arms, the lighting on the chain links, mm -hmm. um, and on the various different components of his backpack. I, I, I tried to make sure that it all corresponded with the same light and direction that I achieved on the armor. Um, because again, that is drawing you into the story of the miniature. So, so uh, on this image, uh, going off what I was just saying there, this is uh, towards more, the more shaded side of Ferris. So you, you can see that the uh the light is going out towards the front of his face rather than um the, on this angle so this angle is quite a lot more right quite a lot there, there's a lot more shading um to show again sell that story of where he's going and what he's doing and then from what i was saying before you can see with fulgrim fighting ferris um he Fulgrim is very flamboyant and rich in color, whereas Ferris is very cold, and it creates that really, really stark contrast between the two of them. Because although before the event that they had the fight, they they were two of the closest of the brothers. They were very, very close together, but they were absolute chalk and cheese, complete contrasts of each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so although it wasn't thought of in the time of creating this piece. It is the overall effect in it. It has been achieved very well because of Keith's style of painting as opposed to my style of painting and the, the colors uh, that are used in Fulgrim and the colors that are used in Ferris just contrast each other so so strongly. Um, the warmth and the, the coldness. The cold. Yeah, it's an emission effect. On, on the next image, um, you can see if, if, you, uh, if you look at the back of his legs, you can see what I was saying about all the different colors overlapping, particularly on the back of his right leg here. You can see um, reds and purples and greens and yellows in the armor. Um, and then you've got some little areas which are quite black, which is creating that cold scuttle black that we tried to get me to, uh, to put into the color, into right. the imagery of the Iron Hands, which I thought was pretty cool. From this image though, and if, from all of the images, but you can see it pretty well here, you can see one of the most iconic things of Ferris Manus, which was his uh, metallic arms. So uh, getting the transition of flesh through to metal was very interesting to achieve. Uh, I, had to... I, was just gonna, I was just gonna ask you about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it was dick it, uh, difficult because I had to go back and forth with flesh and metallics. Because uh, obviously the the finish of both is is very very different. Um, so I would glaze one way and glaze back the other way to try and get the colours to, to blend into each other. Again, keeping the the cold blue 
of the the metal into the recesses of it so Vallejo gun metal blue is a is a fantastic color and that's what I used as the base color for uh, the the arms and then built it up through various different gray metals and and finishing on the um, Vallejo air metal range the steel which has got a really really fantastic finish on it a very reflective and high pigment concentration whilst it being a very thin paint so it goes on to the model really really lovely you can use it to pick out those those highest highlights um which helps to focus the eye towards the light sourcing that i i was saying about right over the whole miniature as you, you're looking at up here the the uh the left arm going up underneath the shoulder pad is actually in quite a shaded part of the miniature so the the flesh tone isn't very light in that area but um on the other images where you, uh, on the very first image where you can see the top of his arms you can see that uh, it's a it's a lot lighter to again show the contrast uh, you can see the top of the arms there which are a lot lighter in color right. um and obviously that matches the the direction of lighting on the face and the and the rest of the armor to uh, Again, emphasize the uh, the sourcing that I used, the imagery that I used <laughs> when I tried to uh, to make the model um, stand out as much as could. I, I, somebody else that was very important in um, the painting process of doing these miniatures was Simon Egan as well, because uh, Simon Egan, the designer um, who sculpted most of the Primarchs, so I, I would right. sit down with um, Simon and Phil and to start with Mark and Keith came in as well to drop different eyes uh, ideas onto the models as well um, so I had a, a sort of brainstorm of what to do during the paint, painting process um, but Simon I, I would ask him specifically um, what was his image of the model when he was designing it where was the focal points what angles uh, was he particularly interested in showing off on the miniature what points he wanted me to make stand out the most Horace was a really interesting one because of the angle that he stood on you have to get the head angle exactly right and uh, because Simon is very very particular about the miniatures because he <laughs> is so good as a sculptor um, when I originally made the Horace model um, <laughs> I was gluing the head in and, and Simon was kind of watching over my shoulder uh, <laughs> making sure that I, uh, I got it on exactly the right head angle um, otherwise, he wouldn't have let it, it be seen. You've mentioned several times, basically, the, the idea that it was very much a team effort. Mm, yeah, uh, and, it, everything about it, because we were quite a close-knit team. We, there, there was an awful lot of people crammed into a little room, um, and so much so that we were practically sitting on top of each other. But <laughs> I, I, I think that really helped, because... Uh, because it helped to make us a closer team and we all worked together and bounced ideas off of each other and we'd all show interest in what other people were doing to uh, to create that bond and the togetherness in what we're trying to achieve um and, and that goes from the right. writers to the the artists to the painters to the designers we'd all work together because we were all trying to achieve the same thing but in different mediums if you like with that in mind matt one of the central claims that I made in my first uh, Forge World video was that you guys were a, a dedicated team who had a very clearly defined concept, uh, an aesthetic, and also even an editorial line. To what extent would you agree with this um, statement of mine? Well, I would say it largely came about from when Phil joined the studio. Uh, and that was a long time before I was there. Um, I, I used to go along to various stands and events and go up and speak to Mark and Phil when I was still a customer. And, love speaking to them but i i would i would hazard a guess that the aesthetic and the concept came about from when phil joined the studio because he was such an established person in in what he was doing anyway and from him others would learn um it, it was largely based upon scale model painting um because that was what phil did um and then a fancy element was kind of thrown in purely because of the imagery of the product because it, it is obviously a games workshop product so mm -hmm. it's a sci-fi fantasy game so uh taking the military scale model model painting and throwing in a fancy element to it as well um and it kind of made, made the forge world style interesting it yeah so so we didn't really we weren't really ones to massively focus on edge highlighting and almost comic book style which is kind of what i see 
the Citadel style as the 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 heavy metal style is is very yeah comic book like but we we didn't really focus on making those the key and obvious points um rather than using edge highlighting to make sure every armor panel would stand out you'd use other effects like uh, weathering effects or chipping or battle damage um or contrast of color where one armor panel would lead into another on a different angle you would use different hues and color intensity to to create the difference between those two panels and that depicts where the light is hitting the most since you mentioned the the citadel style of painting as opposed to the ones that, that you guys set forth as a team there's been some controversy about the way in which the the new horus heresy miniatures are being painted in the last few years there's lots of different opinions about that but i, I think it's evident that there's been a departure i know that you wouldn't want to add to the controversy but uh, what would you say to those who like myself are a bit nostalgic about the past, you know? Different painters will always have different styles. Different people learn different things. When I first started in the studio, I was always the sort of person that would try and copy the the most common thing that I saw, which was the heavy metal style. So I had to learn the different styles as well. But as different painters change, different styles will change. And it's not just the painters that style th- uh, that change things. It's also the other staff around them because other staff might see different concept images and have different ideas of the way that things want to be achieved i left the studio and other artists took over and then those artists have left the studio and phil left the studio with all these different people leaving and different people coming in from different backgrounds and different ideas that they they might have everything is always going to change and i i don't see that as a bad thing because that it's now their their baby isn't it It, it's not (laughs) my baby anymore to to me it was a hobby within a job or a job within a hobby of which i learned lots of things and i got to put things out in a way that i wanted to and now they're doing exactly the same um and and i think that's the the glory and the, the the joy of it being what it is is that it is a hobby um, and everybody can enjoy the things that the way the way that they want to do it if they don't like the way that they're seeing something done these days well then you've got the freedom to go and do it the way that you want to do it yourself <laughs> you can absolutely take ideas from what you're seeing some people do use those and then you can use ideas that you see from other people to and create your own imagery of it um i i certainly do it i i if i don't particularly like the way something looks i'll do it my own way because it's my hobby it's i paid the money for the models and i can paint them however i want to paint them um there's there's nobody out there that can tell you no you're definitely not allowed to do that if i want to paint uh a sons of horus army depicted in a different color scheme i can go and do it yeah it might not fit with the ip but i can still do it if i want to that's the joy of it why tie yourself to one thing when there is so much out there that you can use to your advantage absolutely i couldn't agree more and i think you put it very well matt you mentioned panels before and uh, the, the lighting of panels specifically. And I wanted to ask you about something which has been, I mean, between quotation marks, controversial, but only in the military modeling world, which is the use of um, what they know as color modulation. So mm. that's, that's like a technique that I'm currently trying to learn and struggling with, to be honest. Um, what's your what's your opinion about it? What's your take on it? It's a, it's very integral to the the style that I paint in. When I'm painting, well, you can see it on that model on the screen right now. There's a there's a massive amount of color modulation going between the different hour panels. You can see the variation in, and in the tones within the model. So that's what you're referring to with color modulation. I assume. Yep. I achieve this through pre shade and then putting co- colors over the top that. A, a semi-transparent so that you get the the volume of color um and through the pre-shading i put one color on and i achieve three different tones from it with a very smooth transition as you go through creating an intense light where you want the uh the the most light to be hitting the model a nice deep depth to the color where the most contrast and that the shade would be on the model I, I absolutely think that color modulation is very very fundamental and should be a very key component to any miniature painting um if if you're doing it in the forge world style this is beautiful definitely i'm not sure i'm i'll be able to emulate it anytime soon but (laughs) it looks incredible oh anybody can do it i and a couple of others also taught as a group we we taught over 300 people 
And those 300 people can use word of mouth to pass it on to other people and show other people, show their friends how to do things. There's so much out there, so, so much wealth of knowledge that you can use to, to learn the techniques and then practice the techniques. And nothing can ever be 100% perfect because you can always learn something else to add to it. And, and anybody that says that they can't learn something <laughs> is their own worst enemy. Uh, <laughs> it's really good when people share, isn't it? Oh, a hundred percent. That's why it's a hobby. I think that's a really good thing about the uh, bracketed 30k scene um, is that <laughs> we are very close knit. We, we are very in tune with each other, and we like to help each other and make, help other people to enjoy the hobby the way that we like. Absolutely, Matt. With that in mind, I meant to ask you if you had a, a an army of your own or, or more than one, of course. Yeah. So my current army, um, I've got my talents of the emperor. As I was a 12 year old boy going into my local games workshop store, it was the age of second edition and um, visions of heresy, um, collected visions, the the artwork books um that told a story going through them um i would look through those books and i would be so excited about what i was seeing i'd go in and i'd pester the staff in the games workshop stores <laughs> constantly saying when are these going to get done i want these so much and for years and years and years and years there was never ever anything going to be done about the custodian guard the primarchs they they these things would never get miniatures because they were myth and uh, <laughs> legend um, within the 40k law, but uh, you know, Horace Heresy came around and these things started getting released, and it was just like a, a hobby heyday for me. It was my my dream hobby, um, so my dream army got released, and I had to do them. Uh, they, <laughs> they were everything that I wanted within my hobby collection, and I, I made sure that I used the models that were available and made loads of conversions to create an image of these models that I drew directly out of the book, um, the, the Visions Heresy book. So my Terminators have got the, the fire pikes to kind of mimic what they had in the, um, in, in the books with two-handed fire pikes uh, with eagle heads breathing out fire from the end of them. My jet bikes are completely different to the, the jet bikes that you can buy. I, I did an awful lot of conversions to turn them into how I wanted them to look. And I spent an awful long time trying to, uh, to create as good a paint job on them as I, as I could because I wanted them to be perfect. They were my dream army. Um, so you see an awful lot of people doing non-metal metallics these days. Well, I wanted to create that sort of effect, that mirror image, uh, mirror gold effect with light transitions going on. Um, but in true metals so how would i achieve that right mm -hmm. rather than just using darker and lighter shades of gold i thought i would use the color wheel and to create my transitions and my shades and my shadows and my, my depth to my armor i used purple because purple is a contrasting color to yellow on the color wheel and I, uh, so there is, there is no darker tones of gold within my gold it, it, all the color the, the depth to the color is you is achieved using purples and then i built the colors up to lighter hmm. gold to create um, the, the the reflections and the the focal points and the light sources um, and the, the non metal metallic look within true metal metallics. So it, yeah, so it, uh, it's a army that I'm very very passionate about. I absolutely love the army. I love that it's different to Astartes and Legionaries, which I painted God knows how many. On the Sisters of Silence, um, I knocked up the concept ideas for them, and then um, I got. A commission painter to put the base colors on for me uh, because I was very very snowed under trying to get an awful lot of stuff done at the time so I, I yeah so I got a commission painter Phoenix Studios to paint on the the base colors for me and then I tarted them up from there and added mm -hmm. stronger contrast to the armor and um, did all the edge highlighting and all of the stuff to bring it up to what I wanted to see on a tabletop um, yeah. but it certainly helped by getting base colors done for me so i didn't have to spend the time doing that a uh, truly amazing army how many points is it um, i'm just painting up the orion and a contemptor now um, and i think that takes it to between five and a half thousand and six thousand points <laughs> i've also got my titanicus going on as well uh, titanicus is actually my favorite of the gaming systems at the moment i, I love the way that it plays um so i've got a, a backstory for my, my titan legion i i I'd spent all this time doing such clean miniatures in the talons that i wanted to go back to doing the grim dark effect mm. 
uh, with all the weathering effects onto uh, a Titan Legion. So I'm bringing in the scale modeling uh, colors. So I, I, I took some scale model colors and created a very militaresque color scheme, which I could utilize various weathering products to their maximum. And then I was waiting around for ages and ages and ages for various transfers sheets to come out. And I got to the point that I just got sick of waiting because they just mm-hmm. didn't get released. So I ended up going with and making a backstory for, but on, on my Griffonicus, I came up with a backstory to them where um, the Princeps Senioris was the brother of the senior Princeps of, of Legio Griffonicus. And they had a massive falling out because uh, cause he was so gung ho crazy and just wanted to <laughs> charge forward and have fights in combat and take all the glory for himself that he was sent out in his own sub crusade with uh, his maniple to, uh, to to go out and bring glory and he was stripped of the yellow in the in the color scheme um, right. and had to to learn how to evade the enemy because he didn't have a constant repair workshop to help sort his his battle titans out if they got <laughs> battered and, and damaged so uh, so i tried to almost make camouflaged walking battle titans which is uh, it's kind of <laughs> interesting to uh, to think of a battle titan being camouflaged but if you look at that into an urban scene i wanted to make it kind of fit in the idea is that all my titans have close combat weapons to to go along with what my princeps senioris wanted to achieve in his own personal battles, they all wanted to do the same. A great example, um, in my opinion, of how one should create an army with the narrative in mind first. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Every, everything's got to have a starting point of, of what you want to achieve in it. And if it builds from there, then it builds from there. So it can only get better, can't it? Before my Titanicus and my Talons of the Emperor, I had my Ultramarines army, which was an absolute pride and joy. I absolutely loved doing that army. I've won two Golden Demons with elements of them. Uh, the Ultramarines was my very first ever Space Marine army when I was a, a child. I've always enjoyed painting blue and gold. When I was in the studio, I, I left um, my, my final book that I worked on was book four. And with book five coming with the Ultramarines in it, uh, the Ultramarines were just getting developed. Um, I was seeing imagery of what the suzerain were going to be like. And Simon Egan would bring in the concept of Gilliman that he was working on. And um, I had this imagery in my head of uh, space Romans and you got the Praetorians of the Romans, which were the suzerain. And I wanted to make that, that I, but I didn't want to do that unit until I had an army worthy of being led by them. So I made this massive army and my, my friend Joe Wesley helped me out by doing some of the base colors onto the infantry models of which I then finished off. He he was one of the, the guys that I taught to paint when I was teaching people to paint. He helped me to get the big bulk of the army done to a certain standard and then I finished it off and did the extra bits on it that I wanted to do. Um, and then when I got to a point that I was happy and ready to go ahead and make my prize unit, the, these this these space Praetorians of the Romans, <laughs> uh, along with the, the space Caesar, which was Gilliman, um, I, I wanted to create that that unit and it took me about a year to finish because i was being pushed to make sure i did it to the highest possible standard because i wanted to enter into golden demon and uh, i was contemplating putting gilliman in as a single miniature and having the the squad as a squad category but i was i was told no wait why why settle for second best (laughs) <laughs> um, when you can push for the, for the best why, why settle for silver when you can get gold and if you're going to get gold you might as well go all in so i put gilliman with the the unit and that unit that you see on the screen there that that's the one that got me gold at golden demon but um the suzerain i had this image in my head the, the mark three miniatures that you can buy from forge World just didn't suit what i i had in my mind and uh, the artwork for them they had mark right. four armor so i wanted to have them in mark four armor with the billowing cloaks and the turges and in my head romans didn't fight with axes they fought with spears and gladiuses so mm-hmm. i wanted them to have spears so i had to generate all the spears which was an absolute pain in the bum because an awful lot of uh, money's worth of models that went into them <laughs> um and the shields i wanted to have them pretty smooth um, so that I could create my own image on them with, with the artwork that I've put into it. The shoulder pads, I wanted them to be more Romanesque. So I used Phoenix Terminator shoulder pads and arms, and then the spear and the shield came from 
Moloch, which is the chapter master of the Minotaurs. Right. Then there are um, legs from the Palatine Blades. The bodies came from the Sanguinary Guard. The heads came from the <laughs> Ultraman Suzerain Kit. The hammers, one came from Inquisitor Quotias. Mm -hmm. uh, then the cloaks came from various miniatures, mainly from the Master of the Chapters from a long time ago. Uh, the backs of the, uh, the crest behind the head, that, that came off of custodian guard my goodness <laughs> then all the yeah the, the paturges i wanted more movement in them so i got the plastic ones and chopped them up and made them into individuals so i could get more movement and flow in them yeah so it, it took a long time to acquire all the bits for the, the unit um and then to paint it as well and then gilliman i wanted him a little bit more adventurous than the standard manager so i raised the leg and changed the head and hollowed out the helmet and the the helmet was uh, Chaplin and Comey's helmet, which I hollowed out and then stuck a, a shouting face into it. And then I ex had to extend the fenders down the side, stick wow. the um, antenna on the side of it to give it that command element that Gilliman is legendary for. Then I used one of Ferris Manus's, um, the, the ends of one of the chain surges as a little detail on the front of the crest. <laughs> uh, sorry, yeah, on his head crest. Then um, the eagle behind his head. I took the one off of the uh, the banner on the back of his base and just heat heat bent that around. And I had to fill in a little bit with putty and whatnot. But the idea for it was that I, I took the halo that normally sits above his head, worked that into his backpack, and then the eagle that sits behind his helmet. I designed it so that the head of the eagle. If you look at it on, on the, the a straightforward front angle the eagle sits directly in the middle of the halo wow. and then his face is in front of the eagle um, and that's what i wanted to uh, to achieve on that but um by lifting that leg as well i had to re-sculpt a lot of the turges to make sure that they sat smoothly within there and his right forearm uh, i chopped off the right forearm and took the one off of horace's left arm and put that onto there because it's got a little imperial eagle on there just to look, make it look a little bit ornate more ornate there was an awful lot of work that went into it you just, just don't realize really but um you know i i wanted to create this in my opinion my mm -hmm. masterpiece my my thing that would bring me the gold at golden demon so i had to really put my all into it and the ultramarines once i'd finished that unit was an army that i've I considered was done Be before the ultra means I had my son's a Horus army, which I was working on the whole time that I was in the studio. And I, I never wanted to do something to Horus cause I, I <laughs> massively dislike traitors. Um, but <laughs> each person in the studio had their own army, uh, Legion army that they were working on. And the only one that wasn't being done was the sons of Horus. So, uh, I ended up with the sons of Horus and I, I was originally going to do it as a uh, Baden's first company. Um, and I wanted it to tie in to the Lunar Wolves because I wanted it to be uh, just after right. Ulanor, after um, Horus had been made the War Master. So rather than having the red of the Just Therian, I, I wanted the, I put the green marble to the green sort of gave the tie in to the Sons of Horus. But the black still kept the, the story of the Just Therian. And then the white surges gave the tie in to the Lunar Wolves. And that that's what i tried to achieve in in my models on there but the army just ended up developing because horace came out and he's so damn cool that i just <laughs> wanted to have an army of horace in so yeah I, I did my own horace and that that was my army from there and th that was put into the uh the centerfold of the model masterclass book three which I was i was pretty proud of but that army i'd say i've learned an awful lot since painting that army that army was um done very quickly in my off time whilst working as a painter as well so uh wow <laughs> I, I i would say it's not painted to the, the highest of my abilities whereas opposed to the ultramarines and the talons i think i've i've learned an awful lot more and become a better miniature painter from it hmm. uh, matt what about right now what are you working on right right now is there anything on your on your workbench yeah so i've got the orion and one of the custodies contemptors uh, i've got to paint both of those up ready for um I'm, i'm going on the 30k channel to do a battle report on there 
oh, really? um, against an Empress Children Army, which uh, is my, my friend James. Again, working the purple and the, the gold color mm-hmm. contrast onto a battlefield, it'll just look for a spectacular looking battle report is, is what I'm hoping for. Um, but the, uh, the, the Orion, I don't think it's going to make it into the battle report, but it needs painting anyway, so I just thought I might as well get it done. Uh, the Contemptor, I want to have it done for the battle report. And if I have enough time, I've also got um, a Janisha Kroll conversion that, I'm work- that I've, I've built that hmm. I want to get painted as well. Interesting. Any more Titanicus, or is that now closed? No, no. Um, so I keep toying with the idea of doing an- another uh, Legio, but I've got a Warlord that is part built, but I'm, I'm wondering, I'm, I'm just pondering on the idea because I didn't want to have any Warlords in my Griffonicus Manipal because of the uh, mainstay of the Legio being the Reaver. But I, I just figured, well, now there's a side Titan that I could ally in. So <laughs> rather than finishing the, this uh, this Warlord off, I think I'm going to wait and get the, the side Titan kit to go onto it so I can then ally it in rather than it being an actual Warlord with my Legio. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to put a Warbringer into it as well. Um, I'm, I'm sure I'll add more and more and more as we go along, <laughs> but is there ever an end to it? Is there ever a com- completed state? Yeah, I guess we just start with something new, right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll see. I'll see what happens. Okay, Matt, we've been at it for quite a while and very conscious that I'm taking up a lot of your time. First of all, I just want to say again, this has been a true honor and a privilege for me, as well as a lot of fun. Uh, it's a shame that you haven't been able to see me because you would have seen that I was grinning all the way through the recording <laughs> really really have enjoyed this and, and i hope that the viewers will as well uh, thank you very much for your patience and uh you're welcome for sharing the the images with us as well that that's truly generous of you and for helping me identify you know who painted what turns out mostly it was you <laughs> i can't take all the glory for it there's uh, there's a team there that have done lots and lots of things since there were people there that did things before and there were other people that did work whilst I was there as well. Thank you very much for, uh, for having me on. It was, uh, it was, it's been really good to chat and waffle, lots and lots of stuff to do with the hobby. It's been really enjoyable. Thank you so much, Matt. If you're as passionate about the Harris as I am, you will be pleased to know that another member of the original Forge World Heresy team has been kind enough to agree to an interview on The Race for Terra. When I started this channel back in May, I couldn't have imagined that I would be able to interview the very same artists that I've been trying for years to emulate as a hobbyist. This is truly a dream come true for me, and I'm so happy to be able to share it with you guys. So, if you want more in-depth Horus Heresy content like this, subscribe now and spread the word about the channel. And remember, in the grim darkness of the 31st millennium, there is only weathering. <laughs>